Now, if I have your attention, ladies and gentlemen, um, start our last speaker before lunch is uh, Oliver Mahan. Uh, Oliver is a GMIT graduate in civil engineering and is now senior vice president of CRH, one of our uh, very largest companies. Uh, his responsibility for CRH businesses in Ireland and Spain. Uh, during his career with CRH, Oliver has uh, also had responsibility for uh, diverse CRH businesses in places as far as India and Finland, to name but two. Uh, so today Oliver is going to tell us a little about his career after leaving GMIT, uh, some of the scope of CRH, uh, and also to consider maybe some of the future directions in building materials and products. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, as Martin said, my name is Oliver Mahan. I uh, am a, a former graduate of GMIT. I came here in 86, did two years here, did a civil engineer and technician course. Um, after two years, I moved on then, went to Dublin, into Bolton Street, did a diploma in structural engineering, and went on then and did a degree in, uh, in Bolton Street as well, and graduated in 91. Um, during my time in, in, in college, I did some summer work for Roadstone, and straight after I graduated in 91, I joined Roadstone, and I've been with them since. <coughs> um, I suppose Roadstone is part of the CRH group. Uh, it's the, the R in the CRH, and I'll, I will, we'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that. I'm also very conscious that I'm standing between you and your lunch, so I'll tip on this at a, at a, at a fair pace. Um, a little bit about CRH, I suppose CRH was formed in 1970. Uh, two Irish companies, uh, Roadstone and Irish Mint, came together, uh, formed, the merged in 1970, uh, started off, you know, 100% Irish-based company with a revenue of about 28 million and about 5,000, uh, just over 5,000 employees. Through the, the 70s and 80s, we, we expanded into, into Europe first, then into America built up businesses in going into an area, buying a business, a f usually a family ran business in America. We'd put in a financial, a financial person to look after the checkbook. We left the management in place. We left the, the company name in place. And we worked with the management team that was there and we grew and developed the business. And we, we like to buy businesses in areas where we could build, buy more and build on and expand. <coughs> I suppose our goal was always to become number one or number two in any of the local markets we were in. Because we felt that in our, in our business, if you were down number three, four, five, six, you were at nothing. You had to be in the top two, really, to make an impact in the, in, 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 in the local businesses. So we built that up through the, right through the 80s into the 90s, um, I suppose. Uh, in, in the 2000s, then, we moved into Asia. We looked at Asia. We, we went, to, uh, went to Asia in 2001, and we spent eight years looking at different businesses, and we bought our first business, uh, a small cement business in China, um, up in, in, in the northeastern <coughs> part of China. Uh, then that moved on, we were able to buy, buy into another business. But in China, you can't own more than, than a per certain percentage, so we were able to own 26% of a business in China. Huge scale but a tough place to do business, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a while. Then we moved into India. We bought a 50% stake in a, of a business in India, uh, down in, in uh, Andhra Pradesh in southern India, and we built on, and, and we expanded that over time as well. But also, huge opportunities in, in Asia, but huge risk and huge challenges as well. Then we, we continued, we put in our, uh, our Asia head office in Singapore in about 2013, and then the wholesome assets came available. This was two businesses that came together. They were the number one, number two in the industry. They came together, they merged. As a result, they had to sell off some of their assets. So in 2015, we were lucky enough to buy seven, seven billion um, euros worth of assets, which really moved us into a different place. So from very, very humble, small beginnings in Ireland in 1970, we moved on. We're the number, number two worldwide at the moment. We have uh, sales of just under 30 billion a year. 
We have about n over 90,000 employees. Uh, we're number one in America uh, in, in, the, con in, in the, the, the construction materials business. Um, we're in 31 countries around the world. Uh, and I suppose we have a very clear goal. Our chief executive is Albert Manifold. Very clear goal to be number one in the building materials uh, uh, space, but also to be you know, number one company across all sectors. So that's, that's our goal going forward. So what do we do? I suppose we have our businesses broken up into three different types. We have heavy side businesses, which really is concrete, asphalt, cement, uh, contracting, that part of the business. Then we have light side businesses, which we call, you know, they're glass, they're fix, fittings and fixtures. If you look in, 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 in this room here, we have a huge amount of, of fittings that are holding on panels that, that our companies would, would manufacture. These are usually, you know, we call them light side. They're lightweight, they're easy to transport around the place. They have to be, you have to be very efficient, you have to be very uh, quick to, mar to change, and you have to, you know, really be, 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 be moving with the market demands, and they're usually quick. And then we have the whole distribution business, uh, building materials distribution businesses, that's DIY stores, it's uh, building merchants. Big around Europe, uh, we're, we're, we're not, <coughs> we don't have it in Ireland, uh, but around Europe we're, we'd be number one in, in uh, Central Europe really. Uh, we had it in a uh, strong business like that in America, we just sold it off there in January, and we reinvested the money into our cement, uh, other cement businesses in the US. So, listen, I won't go into the detail there. That's, that's really what we are, 30, you know, just under, under 30 billion uh, sales a year and an EBITDA 3.3. A uh, um, little bit about America, as I said, number one in Europe in, in, um, in, in the building materials. Um, we're in all the states in America. We're in, in Canada as well. Uh, we're just just growing all the time and, and developing all the time and, and, and moving on. In Europe, we're on the heavy side materials, we're number one. We, we, we're big into vertical integration, where that means we, we like to, to own the aggregates, the rock on the ground. We like to own the cement plants to produce the cement. And then we like to bring that down through ready mix concrete, get it out, get it in through asphalt. Um, and about a third of our our model really is about a third of our, of our product we supply directly to ourselves, which we move on then into the, um, into the, in, in, in through the, through the, the customer chain. Uh, in Asia, as I said, we were very much in India and China, and then with the Halsam, with the Halsam Lafarge deal, we acquired a fine business in the Philippines. Um, again, huge potential here. And we'll talk a little bit about that going forward. Uh, huge potential over the coming years, but an awful lot of risk. We've been in China, and we've, we, we have fine business in China. We, have about, um, we produce about 9 million tons of cement in China a year. When you consider in, in Ireland, we, we produce about, about three. So fine business in, in, in China, but very hard to make money. <coughs> you know, the, the main customer is the government. Your main competitor is the government, our partner, is the government so you know everything is controlled by the government you know <laughs> so it's a hard place to make money but, but there's huge potential in other parts uh, of, of Asia uh, great opportunities but challenges as well there's a lot of talk about sustainability here and the performance of sustainability we're heavily engaged in that we do an awful lot of work with that we're linked into different organizations and it's a big part of what we do and what where, where, where we, we we want to get to so, a little bit about the future. We have spent an awful lot of time and money and, and, and expertise looking at where we see the materials business going and how technology is going to interfere with that in the coming years. And, and the only thing I can say is whatever we, I put up here is our view, and I'm sure it's wrong, but it's, 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 it's like looking into a bucket of milk. You, know, you really don't know what's in there. It's, it's just taking a stab of it at it, but this is our view. I suppose what we'd say is that there are four fundamentals that shape the, the world. And we'd have seen it that um, industrialization and urbanization is huge. An example, in India, 10 million people each year move from the country regions into the cities. 10 million people each year. Uh, so there's cities being built 
to cope with that at a huge rate in India. That's happening right across the world. Uh, you know, it's happening right across the world. It's estimated that 65 million people are going to move from rural areas into cities. And that's where we see the growth and that's where we're planning for growth in the future. It's, it's our view that by 2025, four fifths of all development is going to happen in cities. It's going to be for all focused around cities. So that's where, where we're looking at. We talk about technologies and disruptive technologies and McKinsey's who are, who are well-renowned <coughs> consultants, they've come up with 12 disruptive technologies that they feel are going to change the world over the, over the coming years. And already we've seen that last year. We ourselves have been personally hit by, by um, uh, the, the hackers, the hitters in, in one of our businesses in the Ukraine. We were working away merrily and all of a sudden we just lost everything. And when you talk about your production facilities, they're high tech, the state of the art plant and equipment that's there. <coughs> it's the latest technology that's out there. And in the space of, of I think it took 23 seconds from the time that they got into the system till they completely wiped us out and, and stopped us. So that's very disruptive. Um, and we have all the firewalls and all the safety, the safety procedures and processes you can take, but you, you can get hit and, and we, we got hit. Uh, global interconnect connections. I suppose this really is the amount of trade that's, that's happening globally across the world and it's a huge change. And we have seen that, uh, you know, it has increased tenfold since, since 1990. And in the last, in the last uh, five years, it has, it has tripled. So that's, um, that's a serious um, <coughs> a, a way people are doing business and their, their interactions around the business. And I suppose the other thing that we see it's going to hit the, hit the, the world in, uh, in the coming years is it's an aging world, an aging population. The, um, the population of 65 year olds at the moment, it has doubled, uh, or it's expected to double, sorry, uh, from 2000 to 2050. And it's expected to triple in emerging markets. And you think of the life expectancy in emerging markets at the moment is quite low. And the advances that's being made in, in, in medicine that the life expectancy is, is going to incre increase greatly in, in emerging markets. And think of the pressure that's going to put on resources, put on even, even to, to, you know, to house, and, and, and the pressure is going to put on, on resources and, and uh, demands it's going to make are going to be huge. Th this is an interesting one. This, this really just outlines <coughs> the, a little bit of how technology has moved so quickly and how the time it has taken for, you know, uh, different technologies to hit 50 million users. And if you look at the radio, it took 38 years from once radio um, was introduced, it took 38 years before 50 million people used it. You move on to the internet, it took three years. You move on to, to Pokemon, it took one month. So you see the way technology is changing and, and how fast things are changing. But there, we believe that there are six market fundamentals that are key to construction. And I suppose the first one is, and we, we heard about it from the last two speakers, um, particularly about the last speaker, construction, people don't like things falling down. So construction is based on, on mass and strength. And for that, concrete uh, and, and, building pr and building material products are key to that. Um, I suppose if you ever go to Rome, you'll see that the concrete was first used in Rome in back in Roman times, 2,000 years ago, is still standing there today. Portland cement was only in, was only invented <coughs> in, in 1824, you know, and it hasn't really changed a whole lot since. Okay, technology in producing it has changed, and it's more efficient and it's smarter to do it, but it's still the same basic you basic ingredients you take out of the ground, you put them through a heat process, you you, you form clinker, you grind it down, and next thing you make cement. It hasn't changed a whole lot. In, in, in the last, uh, last 100 years. Construction markets are local. You have to be close to the market. You know, we would see that the cost of, of transporting product is about 15% of the total cost of the product. So if you look at it there, we say that ready mix usually about 15, 15 kilometers. Cement can usually travel about 150 kilometers. Then it starts to get, get expensive. Um, we talk about uh, construction accessories 
you know, as I talk about the fittings and the fixtures, they can really go anywhere because they're lightweight. Construction materials are usually heavy and the cost of moving them is, 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 is important. And that's why we believe it has to be, you have to be local to it. The other thing is that the construction, um, the global construction industry is going to continue to grow. 2015 it was $8.8 .8 trillion. That's about 12% of the global GDP. That's forecasted to grow at about three, excluding China, because I don't know what's going to happen in China. Uh, the, growth, the growth patterns there have been pretty, pretty crazy, but we're not sure. If so excluding China, we feel that it's going to grow by about 3.4% up to about 30-30. About and I suppose how people interact with business, uh, with, with buildings and what they expect from buildings. We heard that in, uh, from Eamon in the last, in the last presentation. Um, and I suppose, you know, we talk, you hear a lot of talk about carbon emissions and a lot of talk about waste and, and waste, waste treatment and generating, generation of waste. An interesting fact is uh, about a quarter of all the waste generated in the U.S. is generated either from the construction of buildings or the demolition of buildings. It's, it's, it's crazy when you, when you think of that. Um, an awful lot of talk, talk about, uh, about CO2 and the cost of CO2, and I'll come to that a little bit later. But CO2, uh, a third of all CO2 is generated from buildings. And the production of cement alone is about 5% of that. And then there's a lot of talk then about natural disasters and we have to have buildings that are resilient, that are able to stand up, and that's where all of the regulations have come into play, and we've seen that. And that is, at the end of the day, it's about providing a safe place for people to live and to work. Talk about re uh, regulations, and I suppose this is an interesting one. This is the number of US regulations. In, uh, the blue is in 1970 and the orange is 2014. And you, you compare the construction industry, the number of them, look at the, look at the pure size of them, 782 and 82 regulations compared to agriculture, which people are eating. It's in our, you know, people eat <coughs> in the food chain. Agriculture is about 80, so it's nearly 10 times more. And we heard it again today. People do not like buildings falling. They want a safe, safe place to, to live and to work. Uh, and the impact, if a building collapses, it usually makes international news <coughs> if, if, if there's a number of, uh, of fatalities. So a little bit about the product productivity in the construction sector. And I think this is, 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 is an interesting one. You look at agriculture between 1940s and today, the, production gr the productivity growth has been huge. The same in manufacture, the same in retail. But look at construction, it hasn't, it's only, it has only increased by about 6%. And you say, why is that? And to, to get productivity, it's about standardized, having a standard, standard method of doing it and, and repeating that method on a regular basis. A lot of construction is standalone construction on sites. We'd have seen that there's a change away from cast in situ to precast. Um, I was in Finland last week, in Finland about only about 30% of, of concrete is cast on site. 70% is precast concrete. It'd be, it'd be the re complete reverse here in Ireland or in the UK. So they have moved away into precast pre buildings. And that is in a, uh, to, to, to get through, the, to increase the speed of construction and the efficiencies. But that's, a, that's an, interesting, an interesting slide. So what are the, the, the realities facing the construction industry? <laughs> There will be future growth, and this is, you know, the best economists in the world have come up with this. They expect that there will be gr growth both in, in, in new and developed markets and emerging markets. It'll, be, it'll, it'll change. It's expected to grow, and providing Mr. Bush and Mr. Kim don't blow the socks off each other, uh, and there isn't a, a, an, an, out war, a, an a, a, a outright war, but it's expected that in the U.S. it's going to grow by just under 4%. And you look at, at India, India with the population that's there and the population growth and the amount of people that are moving, it's, it's, it's expected to grow by around 7%. <coughs> the same in the Philippines, quite high. And Europe is probably, it's probably around 2%. Uh, but it will grow, there's no doubt about that. 
uh, and when the economy grows, construction grows, and the demand for construction goes, grows. Sustainability, construction, or a lot of talk about this. Um, I suppose the cost of, of, and a lot of talk about carbon emissions. In 2005, it, there was zero, zero cost impact. In 2016, that's 13%. We talk about carbon credits. There was no carbon credits in 2005. People had excess <coughs> carbon credits. In December, if you wanted to buy carbon, this is where you can buy a ton of CO2. If you bought carbon in, in, in December, it was costing you about a five or a ton, maybe, uh, maybe, seven, maybe 550 euros per ton. If you buy it today, it's close to nine euro a ton. The view is that that could go to 30 euro a ton. If it does, that's going to drive the cost of materials through the roof. So it's estimated that it's, 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 nobody knows, nobody knows, but it is a cost and we, and everybody wants a cleaner, greener environment, but there is a, there is a cost. We talk, there's opportunities as well, huge opportunities. I take out the Philippines, the Philippines, and I call it the three little pigs. They have gone from building low cost, um, shelters and housing out of the local, local resources, which was, which was straw. But they've been hit by a number of, uh, you know, adverse weather uh, conditions over a number of years, and they have moved away from that. Then they moved on to building it from timber. They were still being hit, and now they've moved on to, there's a, a program put in place by the government to build it out of, out of, uh, out of concrete. Because they don't, want the, they don't want the buildings falling, they want a safe place for their people. They want to save lives. And then I suppose, slow to change. Yeah, why have things changed so slowly in relation to our building products? And I suppose it's about the raw, raw materials and the resources that we have. If you think of it, you know, there's, uh, the demand for ready-mixed concrete globally per year is about 12 billion cubic meters. 12 billion cubic meters. So there's no other substitute product that can meet that those quantities in relation to aggregates and in relation to, <coughs> to, to, to stone, it's closer to, 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 to 30 billion. So there's nothing, nothing that can have those quantities. And if you think of the, our, our limestone or you think of granite, it's everywhere. You know, everywhere in the world, there's raw materials, there's the basic raw materials. And that's why the construction, and we, we, we talk a lot about technologies, but that's why it's very hard to move away from the, the materials that we're using at the moment because they're available, they're close to market, and they're, they're cheap. Uh, and I think that's important. A ton of, st a ton of stone in, in the US is about $10. It's 5% of the cost of a ton of steel. So a ton of stone is about 5% of the cost of a ton of steel. And it's, it's, it's readily available. Uh, spoke a, a little bit about, about technology and the disruption and impact that it can have. And it's everywhere, everywhere in our, in our business, everywhere we go, technology plays a huge part of it. We, we heard about it earlier, we heard about BIM, you know, you, we, we heard about 3D modeling, e-commerce, all of that. And all you need is for someone to hack in and disrupt that very easily, very easy for that to happen with the way things are gone. Um, and and it, it, it's, it, it has happened, it's here. So I suppose, wh where do we put a lot of time and effort into? We put an awful lot of time and effort into innovation. How, how can we work with our basic products? We don't want to move away from our basic products. We want to make them better. We want to be smarter with them. We want to make them, uh, you know, move them with the trends. Because if you don't move with the trends, We'll, we'll, we'll just loo lose our market, our, our market leadership position. So we have to move with that. So a huge amount of effort goes into the design, into the products, into how we can provide a solution for, for our customers. And our, our customers are the contractors. So how can we make life easier for them to build their businesses in a, in a faster, more efficient way? So th we're, we're constantly looking at innovation. And that's really it in a, in a nutshell. I wanted to skip through because I'm conscious that it's close to lunchtime. So thank you very much for your time and your attention. Thank you.